Sounds good. All right. Can everybody online hear me? Ah, uh, now we can hear you. Great. There you go. Perfect. Um, for just a moment. Okay. So, welcome everyone to our German wine seminar. We have Derek uh, Vinicom here from Germany, and we also have some folks joining us here in the metro and from home. So, we're doing a little bit more of a classroom seminar for us today. Um, for most of you who are joining us from home, um, if you could mute your um, uh, uh, microphones and uh, this, it will be recorded. So if you don't want to be recorded or would not like your face on screen, feel free to shut off your video um, and all the technical stuff is out of the way. And uh, the wines, uh, the order that we are going to be doing this evening is um, the Sylvaner. Um, then we have the... Um, the Feinberg, which is the Trocken, I believe. Then we move over to the Dry Carp. And then we finish with the Gewürztraminer. So those are the four wines that we'll be doing this evening. And uh, most of them feel free to keep in the fridge. Um, and the Sylvaner, if you'd like to go ahead and pour that. Derek, if you'd like to take it away. Yes, okay. I'm just going to be starting off with the Sylvaner. Then we're going on to the Carp Schreiber, the Dry Carp. Then on to the sweeter one, the Paul Anhäuser, and then finishing. So we're going from very dry to, to a touch of sweetness. So that would be the order of tasting. Did we get that right? Yep. Yep. So it's Dr. Haydn, Karpschreiber, Paul Anhäuser, and then Machma. Perfect. Good. Welcome to Germany. Thank you. <laughs> nice, to, nice to see a few people on the screen. Um, I've enjoyed this year being able to sit and have tastings, real tastings with people in the US. But um, it's also nice to do something like this again. And during the Corona time, this, times, this is all we were able to do anyway. But OK, uh, welcome to Germany. I'm sitting here in Germany. And this is where I live. Behind me, you'll see the Rhine River. That is where I'm living. Uh, this is a, not an actual picture of what today, because uh, that is a picture during the uh, during the summertime. Um, now, of course, it's the fall, so the leaves are now brown and falling. But um, we have had a marvelous year again. Thank you, climate change. <laughs> yeah. So here we see um, I'm sharing the screen at the moment, a presentation, the estate wine. So we concentrate on authentic wines from Germany, estate wines, produced by people who own the vineyards, who work their own vineyards. And this is something that's catching on in the US very quickly. You have authentic food and authentic wines, and these things must go together. Uh, it's so easy to have authentic food and authentic wine. It can be simple. The main thing is it just has to be real and authentic and not supermarket stuff. And that's why that's where Julio's come in nicely, where you have real authentic wines. So here you see we have 13 different wine regions in Germany, all most of them along the Rhine River. Here we have the Rhine River going from south from Switzerland all the way up. And I am here near Mainz, right in the middle of Germany. And in fact, I am within one and a half hours of all the estates that I represent. So it's, we are one big family all together. It's like a little village. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's get started. So we're going to start off getting a little bit closer in on the map. You see the main areas of Germany. This is the Rhein-Hessen region. And this is where I live. I'm a little village where I live called Nackenheim. It isn't even on the map. So you wouldn't even find it here. It's just near Nierstein on the Rhine. And we're only... 20 minutes from Frankfurt Airport. Um, so everything is very near and close by. So we've, I was talking to Ray just about 
when's the best time to come to Germany? Well, any time of the year can be nice. Instead of, uh, unless you, except for perhaps December, January, and February, where you might run into problems with the weather. But otherwise, it can be nice any time of the year. During the summertime or the spring or fall, it's even nicer to be able to sit out in the vineyards, of course. So we have all these different regions from Germany, and each of these regions have very specific characteristics. And that's this fantastic thing about real authentic wines, where these wines really reflect the terroir. What? Oh, we got a little delay, Derek. There we go. You're back. I disappeared quickly, but we're back again. Hope everybody's still there on board. Oh, yes, we are. Yeah. We're not going anywhere either. <laughs> well, even there was even something left in my glass. Oh, lovely. So the main regions, as I said, all have very specific characteristics. And we're going to look at four different wines today with four completely different characteristics. And, and it's so easy to keep these wines. You realize the difference between each wine. So we're going to start off in the Rhein-Hessen region. And in Germany, we have so we're having some problems here with we'll just give him a moment to reset sorry guys That's why we print out the stuff. So if we want to go ahead while he's, um, if everyone wants to go ahead while he's adjusting um, the uh, Zoom here, if they want to go ahead and start tasting the Sylvaner. And Sylvaner is a relatively new grape for me as well. Definitely have more um, of the light aromatics uh, um, similar to Sancerre. There we go. I think I'll pop back on in just a moment. We did this with Sarah Jessica Parker with her Sauvignon Blanc, and she was able to come on for five minutes. She had to yell at her kids and her husband for using the internet for too, too much time. She's like, even we get bounced off of internet all the time. Something went wrong there. That's okay. No worries. We're used to technology spoofs because I'm Oops. the one who runs it. Do you? So I'm coming back again. Yep. And multiple shares. So we're good there. Yeah. Here we are. And we're recording this too, and so we can always send it out to everybody yes. with okay, a fine, yeah. rough version. We'll try again anyway. I did have folks go ahead and start drinking the Sylvana. Yeah. Seems to be some problems technically. Yeah. We got you now. Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, yeah. Let's let's hope I'm not moving. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're okay. We're okay. Uh, sun, sun, the screen says now sunshine around the corner for German Riesling and friends. Well, I started saying about authentic wines and authentic food. And that's the thing that's catching on in the in the US now that people are realizing with authentic wine, with authentic food, you need some authentic wines. And it really started off about 50 years ago when this pre preconception came out that German wines were all sweet and cheap. You had the Blue Nun, you had these what I call factory wines. Uh, but you have factory wines from any country. You have them in the US as well. So I divide up between beverage wines and fine wines. 
You have to keep this distinction between these two things. I mean, as Julio said, the stores at the liquor store, you have a lot of real authentic wines and you go to a supermarket and go to Total Wine or Costco, you can get supermarket wines. These are fine for what they are, beverage wines, but it's like food. You can go to, you can go to McDonald's and have a burger or you can go to a great restaurant and have a different burger. And especially when I come to the US, I like to go into a restaurant and have a decent burger because you can't get anything like that, that quality here over in Germany. So this is the main difference. That's why I say sunshine around the corner that people are getting onto the fact that you have to differentiate between beverage wines and fine wines. And there is a big difference in Germany. Germany is not just beverage wines. We do have a lot of fine wines. And this picture is now coming through. This picture, in fact, on the screen is the Mosel looking towards Bankastel. And we're going to be tasting a bank uh, of a wine from the Mosel in a few minutes. Yeah, but we also have problems in Germany with the climate change. We've had, since I was mentioning to Ray before, since 1985, we've noticed a big change in the weather patterns in, in Europe. It's been very positive for us so far because we get ripe grapes nearly every year. And before, when I first started off in the wine trade back in 1969, uh, it was very difficult to get ripe grapes. Um, we didn't have enough sunshine, enough warmth. But now we, since 1985, things have changed radically, but we don't just get sunshine, we get torrential rainfall as well. We get hail, we get tornadoes, which we've never had before, tornadoes. And this is what happens in Germany, also with floods and fires. Uh, in California, they know what fires are as well. There have been terrible fires in California. We don't have big problems in the vineyards with fires, although we've had them this year, but our main things is torrential floods. And this happened back in, on the 15th of July, 2021 in the R Valley. Some people might know, have heard about this, where, um, Within a few hours, we had the same amount of rainfall that comes more or less in the whole year, which all came down in a couple of hours. It was um, one of the worst disasters, that has, natural disasters that have hit Germany since World War II. And uh, this was in the R Valley, which is more or less only red wine. And uh, we sell a lot of red wine from the R Valley. And here you see we, after the 15th of July, we wanted volunteers, so I went there with my son, volunteered, helping, clearing up the mud, and because all the cellars were completely flooded or completely destroyed. So I was helping at the R Estates um, in the mud, trying to clean up. Um, it was something very unusual that I have never seen before. Uh, it's not just a, a picture you see, but when you're there, the smell, the stench, because the hundreds of thousands of liters of red wine, which were flowing into the river, uh, fuel, uh, sewage, everything. And there was a terrible stinking everywhere. And of course, uh, a lot of dead people as well. I think in that one day, 130 people died just in that small area. Wow. But oh, back to better things. But that's, that is one of the problems that climate change has brought to us. But on the other hand, it's been positive because we get ripe grapes. But I just wanted to show you a couple of things here. Uh, Germany is very small. We only have about 2% of the world production of wine, 2%. It's, it's really nothing, really. But uh, with Riesling, we are number one in the world. As you can see here, number one. And with Pinot Noir, we are number three. Although we're so small, Germany is number three with Pinot Noir in the world. Also with Pinot Gris, Pinot Grigio, we are number three after Italy and the US. And with Pinot Blanc, we are number one in the world. So although we're so small, we still have some of the important, we are still very important for some of the key varietals. And also what you've just got in your glass at the moment, the Silvana, Germany is number one in the world. So although we're so unimportant, we do have a little bit of importance. I think you guys are quite okay. important in, now we're into the real thing. in the wine world. <laughs> very, very important. Glass. In your glass at the moment, you have the first wine. Cheers to everybody. Ah, Cheers, everyone.
in Germany, if you have, a lot of people have heard this word Prost, which is cheers. But if you're drinking beer, you say Prost. And if you're drinking wine, it's the same as in France. In France, you say Bon Santé. And in Germany, you say Zum Wohl. It's the same as in France. It's to your health. And wine is supposed to be a healthy thing if you don't drink too much. But I say it again, if you aspirin, can, if you have a headache, an aspirin will help you, but you don't swallow 10 or 20 aspirin at the same time. And it's the same with wine. You can enjoy one or two glasses, yes, but it's like aspirin. You don't take 20 glasses of wine. <laughs> well, I mean, five or six glasses are okay as well. <laughs> <laughs> bottles, it's a bottle count you got to worry about. <laughs> so we're starting off with Dr. Haydn. Ah, and Dr. Haydn. A lot of, you might have seen this on some labels. A lot of the wine estates in Germany have the name of doctor in front of them. Uh, I know I've, this question is posed to me many times when I'm showing the wines from our doctor estates, like Dr. Haydn, Dr. Tarnish. Um, doctor, you can be a doctor with your PhD for anything in Germany. So you can be a doctor of agriculture, a doctor of law, uh, a doctor of medicine, a doctor of philosophy. And in fact, Dr. Haydn, he was a, a lawyer, Dr. Karl Haydn. And his hobby was helping his friend, Friedrich Baumann, at the estate in the vineyards. That was his hobby as a lawyer. And when uh, Mr. Baumann retired, um, his two sons didn't want to carry on with the estate. So Dr. Haydn, Karl Haydn, took over the lease on the vineyards and his son has now finished um, his studies and has taken over. So this is how this happens in Germany. If, if you see a doctor, in fact, what Dr. Lozen, for example, Dr. Lozen, everybody knows Dr. Lozen. Um, he, was a, he was a doctor of agriculture, for example, Ernest Lozen's father. So we're starting with the Silvana. And this is where it comes from, Oppenheim. You see, Oppenheim is on the, on the, on the map. Uh, and this is where I am here, Nierstein, uh, Nackenheim, Nierstein, Oppenheim. So everything's very close. I'm only uh, about 10 minutes away to get there from here, where I'm living at the moment. And here we have him, Frank. This is the young generation of growers, vintners in Germany that have changed everything since 1985. These, these youngsters are full of passion and devotion. Uh, and this is what you have to have. You have to have this passion and devotion. Um, otherwise, it won't work. Because being a producer, a winemaker, um, unfortunately, is very hard work. And unfortunately, you don't get rich quick. You get poor quick because the costs are very high to produce fine wine. So you have to have this passion and devotion. Uh, to make fine wine. And the amazing thing is that a lot of the youngsters, especially since the economic crisis, a lot of the youngsters have now realized that it's so something special to work with Mother Nature. Working with Mother Nature to make real authentic wines is something very special. And so we've seen, especially in Germany, not just in Germany, the whole of Europe, we've seen a lot of these, these youngsters become winemakers I'm working damn hard to make authentic, real wines. So this is Frank in his vineyard. And he is in Oppenheim. Here we have the Rhine going, flowing from south to north, Nierstein Oppenheim. And this is where the vineyards are over here. This is a sort of amphitheater and the Oppenheimer Sacktrager. So Oppenheimer, if you're a New Yorker, you come from New York. And if we're showing an Oppenheim wine, it's an Oppenheimer. So a, an Oppenheimer wine comes from Oppenheim. So you see this, the Savannah you have, it says Oppenheimer. So it comes from Oppenheim. And it comes from this amphitheater here. Here's the Rhine Valley, the flat vineyards, where we have a little bit of sand and loam. And here on this hillside, we have limestone terroir. And this is the secret of Oppenheim the limestone terroir. So that was a picture of the, the map. And now you see this amphitheater here, just a shallow slope. So it can be worked by tractor, which makes things a little bit easier. 
and it's more or less all facing sort of east or southeast. So the sun rises over here, that's Frankfurt Airport over here, the sun rises over here, and immediately the sunshine gets into this, into these vineyards to warm up the soil. And then in the, in the afternoon when it's getting very hot, the sun is coming round, and then it is not getting too hot. So in the old days, we wanted very steep vineyards to get more sunshine going straight into the, into the vineyard, but now we're pleased to have these shallow slopes where they don't get too hot. Here we have another view. This is, so this is the Rhine Valley here, very broad valley. So this is the side of the valley here where it goes uphill. And here we have this amphitheater here where Frank Haydn has his vineyards, a very old town of Oppenheim. And that's where the vineyards are over here on this sh shallow slope. Limestone terroir. It's the Haydn estate is not certified organic, but if you put a foot into his vineyards, you would say, hey, this looks organic. And yes, um, they do look organic and he works as close to organic as possible. So he doesn't use any insecticides, doesn't use any herbicides. The only reason he cannot be certified organic is now and again, he might need a fungicide against mold. Um, and this happened especially in 21, where we had a lot of rain during the summer, where we had to spray fungicide twice. But this year, this year, I don't think he needed a fungicide at all. And last year, the organic estate state had real problems not being able to spray fungicide where they lost a lot of crop. And that's a very, very high risk. So I, I can deal with this compromise. I enjoy organic wines, but this compromise is also very good as well. He's taking care of mother nature. Here you see the limestone terroir, this yellowish stone, this limestone, this gives this great chalky minerality to the wine. And this is the key factor of the Oppenheim wines, this chalky minerality. Derek, there is a question that came through on the chat. Ah, good. I haven't got the questions coming up here on this. On the yes, but um, can you let me have the question then? Yep. It, the question is: How much does the uh, river influence the vineyards in this area? This is on the Rhine. You can see this during the fall. That in this weather, weather, with a slope at the side, the leaves are still green, and you go back into the countryside you'll see that the green, the leaves are already brown. So it, there is an influence in the Rhine Valley from the river. It's perhaps one or two degrees, that's all. Wow. But this especially helps during the, the springtime or the fall where we get to temperatures getting too low, where the, uh, the leaves will, will, will suffer from the freeze get down to zero, uh, 32, 32 Fahrenheit, where they start freezing. And this one or two degrees can make a huge difference. That, that's the only reason. So it doesn't really reflect the sunlight. I mean, sometimes you read about how the river reflects the sunlight, but that's not really a, a key aspect. The key aspect is that it, it makes an alteration of about one or two degrees, which is a huge help, especially when, when you have the bud break early in the year, where there's a danger of frost damage. So this can help with the frost damage in, in uh, May, where the temperature can be just above freezing in the Rhine Valley. Mm. This is the key aspect, this very small difference, very small indeed. So Oppenheimer, the one you have in your glass, the one I have in my glass, Silvana. I was mentioning Germany is very important for Silvana. I am very addicted to Silvana myself, and I must pour myself a little bit more. I've got a little bit left here. <laughs> and when I first studied viticulture back in 1969, I studied it in the Bavaria in the east of Germany, and the key varietal there is Silvana. So I fell in love with Silvana before I fell in love with Re fell, in, fell in love with Riesling. But I like Silvana because of its herbal characteristics. It's not over, 
overflowing with peach and, and pear or strawberry. It's more herbal aspects. And you get some hay um, or, or, or um, um, what else would we have? It's more hay, more, more herbal aspects. Um, what else would you say? Fresh grass, yes, fresh grass, hay and fresh grass would also be a thing. Well, the main thing is this, because of the, the, the um, um, limestone terroir, we have this chalky minerality. And that's where you get, when you, first of all, swill it. You swill, if you've got a nice glass, swill it in the glass, and put your nose in, and you get this, these herbal aspects coming out. So it's not, nothing to do with peach or pear not even apple. Yeah, these these definitely fall under yeah. kind of those secondary flavors. Yeah. Which is pretty cool. about hearing. Savannah, the acidity is not high. Mm. So especially if you think a wine is too tart or too acidic to you, this Silvana more or less fits the book very nicely. And that's why I call it my emergency wine, because I <laughs> always have a bottle in the fridge just in case. Um, but this bottle, I opened it, this bottle, I opened this particular bottle, I think, uh, Tuesday, uh, Monday evening. No, Sunday, Sunday. Because I've been out Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And I opened it on Sunday. And this is the good thing about real authentic wine. This wine is still perfect, although I opened it Sunday evening, this bottle. And that's a very important factor. These wines don't have to be drunk within two hours. They usually get better once they've had been opened one or two days, in fact. And this is a key advantage. It hasn't suffered at all. It has, in fact, opened up nicely in the nose, beautifully. And this is a big difference between beverage wines and fine wines, what I mentioned before. Beverage wines, you have to drink within two years of the vintage date. And fine, authentic producer bottled wines, you start after two years. So this is the 20 vintage, and it is now, we're now in the year 2022. So it is now really getting ready for drinking. Um, but thanks to the um, Stelvin seal, this wine will hold for at least another five years. Mm. I mean, I've been tasting Silvana from the Heiden estate, which have been even 15 years old and are still perfect. So this is a key aspect of good wines, that they will, first of all, they get better year to year, and they need at least one year in the bottle before they're ready for drinking. And some wines need even more time, but I think at least two years, but then they get better and better and better. And five years is just no problem at all. So that's a good thing about good wines, that you don't have, and you don't have to worry about drinking it all at once. As I said, I opened that bottle Sunday evening. So Silvana, a very old, original vine, is not a crossing. Um, it, they don't know exactly where it originated, but we think from the Danube Valley. So it's not from the Rhine itself, the Rhine Valley, but it's an old, um, old vine, which used to grow perhaps in the Danube Valley, Transylvania. And it came to Germany about at least 500 years ago. There is written evidence that it was planted 500 years ago, written evidence. So it was probably planted before that. Uh, the thing about Silvana, the nice big berries, big large bunches and high yielding. And whoops, that's the problem. High yielding is not always good for quality. But this is the nice thing, Alter Reben, old vines. These vines are at least 25 years old. And as soon as you get older, um, your yield will automatically go down naturally. So these old vines don't bring many bunches of grapes and the bunches are smaller. So you get an automatic increase of quality because you're concentrating everything into these few berries. But I mean, yield restrictions for pruning is very important, but these old vines automatically, the yield is very low and not just the yield is low, but the roots go down deep. We 
do not irrigate here in Germany. Up to 2003, irrigation was in fact not permitted by law. But only after 2003, where we had the first terrible heat wave during the summer, where it didn't rain the whole summer, that it was permitted after 2003 to irrigate. We don't like to irrigate because we want to force the vines to grow down, the fine roots to go down deep. So 25 years, these roots are at least uh, up to 15 feet deep or even deeper than that. And these fine roots extract all this good stuff out of the soil, all this minerality. So this is what we want to do. We are allowed to irrigate, especially if you're just planting a vine. These youngsters, if they're two or three years old, they haven't got deep roots. So you have to help them a little bit and irrigate. But uh, we don't want to force, we want to force them to go down deep to get the good stuff from deep down. So this is the key aspect. If you see this word alter Raven, old vines on any label, this is this is means that the vine has to be at least 25 years old and is, gives a quite different quality. So limestone terroir and a nice thing, not too high in alcohol, 12 and percent. So these vines, although they're very focused and very concentrated and complex, they are not high in alcohol. I mean, Germany, although climate has changed, it is still a fairly cool climate here in Germany. Yeah, so that was the Silvana. I hope you've all enjoyed it because I enjoy the Silvana. And uh, the 20 bit, we've just bottled the 21 vintage, which hasn't even been released yet. It'll be released soon, but we still got this 20, and I'm still drinking the 20 myself. I like the Silvana. One of my favorite wines. Yeah. I hope you're all liking it as well. Yeah. Any other questions? Recommended food pairings. We have one question here. Well, that's that's a nice thing. It's very versatile. I mean, you can drink it on its own. I mean, because it's it has this this minerality and this good structure. Um, you can have it with pasta. You can have it with 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 fine, not with softer cheeses, but with any uh, firm cheeses. Um, I like it with with it'll go with fish because it's not too high in alcohol. That's a nice thing as well. Especially the light fishes that we have up here. Any, like it'll go with salads. Things like that. Um, it has enough acidity. Because you see here, it's got 7.1 7 gram per liter of acidity. So it has quite a nice acidity structure to it. Um, I find it would be very... The good thing about Germany with versatility, with food pairing, you don't have to be too particular nowadays. <laughs> I've been astonished how well wines will go with food, even though I thought it would not fit. Oh, yes. I yeah. agree. Uh, and it's always best to have at least a decent... If you don't have anything else in the house... It's better than nothing. That's why I call it my emergency wine. <laughs> <laughs> it's well, always best the... to have a good a good wine with anything, right? And especially this dry wine will fit a lot of different cuisine. Mm. I mean, I wouldn't have it, for example, not with with hot Asian cuisine. That wouldn't work. Too much. Uh, it's too much. Not, I mean, it's better. Anything is better than nothing, but it wouldn't be the most ideal wine to have with Asian cuisine. Not really, yeah. But if you have a, a fine fish, uh, no problem at all. Uh, just one more question here on the floor. Yeah. Um, the aging on this one, um, what is it? Are they aged in barrels or are they aged in stainless steel? Uh, yeah, this, I mean, in the old days, it was mostly an old cask, oak cask. But nowadays, I mean, since the 80s, Everybody has changed over to stainless steel. This is the modern modern technology has now come to the cellars. So Dr. Haydn, he has old oak casks, but they are mostly used for his Pinot Noir or for higher quality wines. For example, we have a great growth. His best dry Riesling is put into old oak, but it's usually in stainless steel, temperature controlled. I mean, I think back to the times when I was a winemaker back into the early 70s, where we had none of this modern technology. We were not able to do any temperature controlling and things got really out of hand. <laughs> the fermentation was much too warm. Uh, and we were making a mess of everything in those days. <laughs> but it, it, it was learning by doing, learning by doing. Uh, and this is we, we have to control fermentation and keep the temperature 
fairly low. Mm -hmm. So everything is kept temperature controlled nowadays, slow fermentation, and we stop the fermentation or let it go through using chilling. So, and stainless steel. We want complete clarity so that you, you really get no influence from the wood on these sort of wines. Any other questions on the Slavoner? Nope. We can move on to the dry carp. Okay, so we were over here in Oppenheim and we get back in the car and it's one and a half hours drive over the hillsides, this is the, the Hunsruck high hills here. And we go down into the Mosul Valley. Here's the, Mos the meandering Mosul Valley here. And we get to Braunerberg, which is that's Bankastel. And Braunerberg is just a few minutes upstream, upriver from Bankastel. And we get to the Karp Schreiber estate in Braunerberg on the Mosul. Here it is, yeah. Karp Schreiber. Well, I started off with his dad many years ago. And now we've got the youngster at the helm. His dad has retired, but is still helping. JJ, Jobst Julius Karp. So the estate is called Karp Schreiber. Karp is the name of his father, and his mother was born a Schreiber. So they got together, and it was called Karp Schreiber. And here you see the old label that was used in the old days. And now JJ, I call him JJ, has changed over to the, using this label. Carp, the German word for carp is the carp, the fish. And his ancestors were probably fishermen in the Mosul River fishing for carp. So he was called carp. And Schreiber, Schreiber is the German for quill. So here we see the quill. So he's made this sort of logo with using the name of carp and quill. He's a clever guy. But he's, this is typical of the youngsters. They're full of passion and devotion. And he's been very brave indeed. He's signed up for organic certification. He signed up last year and has now started, um, started last year. Um, but the 21 is not certified organic. Yeah, see, it's just a little house. These are all these are all small family producers. So you're getting real authentic stuff where the, the winemaker, the owner, does everything. Yeah, and just the difference. So you saw you saw Oppenheim before, those shallow, that shallow slope. And you here we see JJ at the top of his vineyard. And you see how steep it is here. That's the Mosel here. He has very steep vineyards. <laughs> Very steep indeed. You have to be mad to work those vineyards, really mad. So see all these vineyards over here, they're all steep going down into the Mosul Valley. And here we don't have limestone. Here we have slate. Here you see a view. This is where he was standing. He was standing just over here before. And this is his hillside. It's just, it's just a wall of Riesling, a vertical wall of Riesling. And this is called the, the whole the whole vineyard, that whole slope, slope is called the Yuffa slope. And this particular part here beneath this rock face is called the Yuffa Zonanua. And that's where he makes his best wines here. Zonanua is the German word for a sundial. And here you see the sundial here set into the rock face. And you can only have a sundial where the sun gets at it. Otherwise, you can't, you can't get the time at all. So this is why the sundial is here to if you didn't have a watch in those days, um, you could tell the time from looking at the sundial. So this is the best part here. But as you see, working these vineyards is really tough work. So the wine you've got at the moment, the second wine, I haven't got it at the moment in my glass, but this is the first time that this wine has been poured in the US and exported to the US. It is his dry Riesling. Thanks to the um, global warming, we can make this sort of wine nowadays. In the old days, this would have been impossible to make, impossible, because we would not have been able to get the ripeness level to make a dry Riesling, because the acidity 
the grapes had to be physiologically ripe. And that's something I did not learn when I studied viticulture. We were just measuring, measuring the specific gravity, how much sugar was in the, the berries. But that's not the way to go about it. That's what we've learned since then. The important thing is what I've, this word physiological ripeness. Every berry has little four little pips in it. And these pips are green. And then it's unripe. And when the grapes are reaching ripeness, these four little pips go from green to yellow to brown. And when they are all brown, then you have physiological ripeness, then you can start harvesting. So we go into the vineyards now in this September, we don't measure the specific gravity to see the sweetness level. Mm -hmm. We take the berry and open up the berry and look at the pips to see if they're brown. And this year, in fact, even at the end of August, all these pips were all brown. So we had reached physiological ripeness, even with Riesling, at the end of August. I mean, this is so unusual. I mean, in the old days, it, we didn't used to get to this level of ripeness till middle of October. So you see the huge difference. Beginning of September, they are ready for harvesting and in the old days it would be the middle of October so we're at least four weeks ahead of what it used to be so this is his dry entry-level Riesling dry carp he has two different entry-level Rieslings the dry carp which you have which is completely dry he also has his my carp which is also available in, in in Massachusetts which has a touch of sweetness which would go better with perhaps with Asian cuisine, which I mentioned before. Asian cuisine, spicy food needs a few grams of residual sugar behind it. This, you see, only has 6.7 grams of residual sugar. So that is very dry. Anything below nine is very dry. And there are a lot of dry wines you think is dry, but might have even up to 20 grams of residual sugar. You don't, there's no perceptive sweetness, even up to, to that sort of level, depending on the acidity. So this is, in the old days, people said German wines are too complicated, the label's too complicated. Well, we've, we've made it much simpler. It's just Karp Schreiber. It's his dry Karp Riesling. That's it, making it simple. But it's not a simple wine. It is an estate bottled wine, harvested from his own vineyards in Braunerberg. So it's, it's the first step up the ladder to a good authentic wine, an entry level Riesling. Very crisp, lemony acidity, a little bit of green apple, refreshing and appealing. It's very light in structure. You see only 12.2 gram, 12.2% of alcohol. And we have, I don't, I'm sorry, I didn't have a picture of the, the terroir, the slate. This is roofing slate. So if you see a, Roofing slate, this is what the terroir is in the whole of the Mosul Valley. It's roofing slate. So you get this steely, stony minerality. That's quite different to limestone. Limestone, you get this mouth-watering, I said a mouth-watering um, thing in your, your palate. And with the slate, it's more steely minerality. But it's very refreshing and very, and it says, uh, give me more. That's the nice thing about these wines. They are not too heavy. They are very refreshing, especially if it's hot weather. A wine with only 12, 11 and a half or 12 percent of alcohol still remains refreshing, even if you're going up in the temperature up into the 90s sitting outside. And that's what we suddenly realized. If it gets too hot in the year, in the summer, you cannot drink a wine that has 14% of alcohol. You can drink perhaps one glass, but that's the end of the day. Here with these sort of wines, um, you can drink one or two or three glasses. It's no problem at all. Very refreshing. And this is the only thing I say. I can drink red wines and white wines the whole of the year. It just depends on the weather. Mm. If it gets too hot, I must have a lighter red wine. Can be a Pinot Noir or a white wine. In the winter, when it gets very cold, then a big 
big red wine will go down very nicely, but of course a white wine will do as well. But that's the difference. I cannot have a big heavy red wine in the summer months when it's up into the 90s. That's just too much. But okay, I, I can enjoy agree. any good wine. I agree with you on that. Yeah, good. Okay, so that was that was the Mosel. But as I said, that's the first time we've showed this wine or had this wine in the US, this dry car. Um, and it's very interesting because I've been doing business in Boston with my our distributor since 1970, uh, going back, 70, 1977. I remember back in the old days, we never used to show or sell any dry wines to the US market. They all had residual sweetness, a lot of residual sweetness. But things have changed radically in the US, thanks to the cuisine, which has made tremendous steps forward. And dry wines are now going very nicely in Massachusetts as well. Mm. These are catching on very fast indeed in the US market. And these are the wines we drink here. In Germany, all my friends here in Germany, they're not, my friends in Germany, they're not winemakers. They're dentists, lawyers, or, 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 or something else, or retired now. At my age, they're all retired, but they all drink dry wines. They don't drink sweet wines. They drink dry wines. And these are the wines we drink. And you're drinking them as well now. So this is good news. We're all drinking the same thing. In harmony. So we were over here in Braunberg. We get back in the car and drive over the high hills down into the Naha Valley, the Naha wine region. Quite a small region. This is the Naha River here. It runs into the Rhine. Here's the Rhine. It runs into the Rhine at Bingen. It's not as big a river as the Mosel. Mosel is much bigger. And the Mosel, we have barges. You saw that barge on the Mosel River. There are no barges on the Naha River. It's only a small, little, like a larger stream. But it also has an influence on the weather there as well. Bad Kreuznach, bad. Well, there's nothing bad about Bad Kreuznach. Bad is the German word for spa. Mm. So it's the spa village of Kreuznach. So a lot of these towns in Germany have the word bad, bad, bad in front of them. And that's the German word for spa. Uh, down here, Bad Dürkheim, for example. We have a lot of wine from Bad Dürkheim. It's not bad wine at all. It's a wine from the spa village because if it's a spa, it means you've got good air and good water there. And that's the key aspect. It's very good for reconvalescence. And in the old days, people used to be paid to go there to the hotels to reconvalesce. Well, now you have to pay for yourself. But uh, this is what all these places are. It's like going to the seaside. Mm -hmm. We don't have a seaside. So you go to these spa areas to reconvalesce or just have a, uh, it's a big tourist area, of course. So. Anheuser. It might ring a bell to some people, the name Anheuser. Well, the, the ancestors of the Anheuser family, they came to the US many years ago and started off a brewery in uh, St. Louis. So this is the original Anheuser from Germany and not the Anheuser-Busch family that came to the US. Well, it's the same family, but it's... Uh, the people here, the, this part of the family, are not the rich part of the family. They didn't brew beer. They only made wine. So the ancestors have only been winemaking, not brewing beer. Yeah, so this is a very old estate. A family estate, again. And here you see the two brothers, Paul Christian and Christian. And here's mum. She is absolutely marvellous, Dorothea. Uh, she's now over 80 and still working and enjoying life. She looks after the office and the two sons look after the winemaking and the vineyards. And here you see some of the grandchildren, a lot of girls, hopefully for the next generation. This is also something very specific in Germany. When I studied viticulture, there were no women studying viticulture in those days. None at all. It was a man's world. Uh, but things have radically changed since then. And at least third one, yeah, look at that thumbs up over there. <laughs> at least one third are now women winemakers. At least one third. Right. And I must admit, women do the job very well indeed. They work damn hard. 
they put on their boots, they drive the tractor, they clean the, the tanks, they do the tough work as well, and they do it well. And they have a very good taste. And of course, they're good at selling wine. I couldn't agree with you more. I agree with all of them. No, no, no. women, uh, it's been a massive change that women, women also have developed this passion and devotion. Yeah, you need it. So you, here you see Dorothea and Paul at work. And what do we do work? We're tasting wines, of course. Uh, Germany, we're trying to digitalize and get modern. This is what the office used to be like in the old days, but it has been modernized a little bit now. Uh, but unfortunately, Germany is still hanging behind, but we, we are modernizing as fast as we can. And I was talking about that where we use stainless steel. But at the Anheuser estate, we still have a lot of old casks. So we don't, they don't use new casks, they use these old casks. So there's no wood influence coming into the wine. It just lets the Riesling breathe because we regard the wine as a living product and it has to breathe. So Paul likes to use his old wooden casks to give the wine time to breathe before it's bottled. Mm. Here we see Paul in the vineyard. So it's, this is the Naha River here, a beautiful rural area, very picturesque, uh, not as large as the Mosul Valley and certainly not as large as the, the Rhine Valley. You saw how broad the Rhine Valley is. This is only a very narrow little valley here. And this is one of his key vineyards here. And also you see, it looks fairly organic. Paul is also not certified organic but he works as close to organic as possible. And here he brings straw into the vineyards, which is then plowed under to help the soil. So this is a completely new wine, but I think this is going to fit the US market exceptionally well. So it's a Kreuznacher, so it comes from a, so it's a village wine coming from his Kreuznach vineyards, 100% Riesling and the 2021 vintage. And this is not completely dry. So it's not in Germany for, if it's completely dry, we use this word, you saw it on the label before this word trocken. We had the word trocken, which is the German for dry on the Silvana and on the My Carp, it said, trocken on. This is fine herb, dry style. So it's a little bit above what is completely dry, but below what would be sweet. So we don't have any perceptive sweetness. There's just this little bit of sweetness hiding behind the acidity. You see it's 13.5 grams per liter of residual sugar, so not much acidity, not much sweetness, but balanced with a nice bit of acidity. So the perceptive sweetness sort of disappears behind the acidity, but it makes it very versatile. And I mentioned before, this would be then the wine to have with your Asian cuisine. Anything spicy and hot would go very nicely indeed. Also, not high in alcohol. Before we were just above the 12% of alcohol, here we are below 12, we're here only at 11.4 because we are stopping the fermentation before the wine, before the juice has completely fermented. So we have this, we're stopping the fermentation using cold, chilling, and then the alcohol doesn't go up so high. We're not adding sugar. This is just the fermentation being stopped. So it has these few grams of residual sugar, to balance it out, to make it more appealing, very crisp, very mineral driven, but very light in structure. And of course, as I said, very versatile with Asian cuisine, which of course is one of my favorite cuisines, which you have at every street corner now in the US. And of course it would go very well with Mexican cuisine as well. Anything hot and spicy mm. or Indian cuisine. I was just gonna say that. And that's yeah, Indian cuisine. Also very nice indeed. Uh, some of these would, some of this would be a borderline. Some might need even more sweetness, mm. but we have other sweeter wines as well. So this might be a borderline where it might just manage to fit with 
with uh, Indian cuisine or Asian cuisine, uh, but certainly better a better match than anything that is bone dry, trocken. So this is a sort of wine, it's a sort of multi-purpose wine, which is certainly excellent for salads, any salad with a nice, uh, with nice vinegar on it, a vinegar dressing would go very nicely here. Or any light food, any delicate food, any light delicate food, any fish, any uh, freshwater fish, trout, that would be perfect with this sort of wine. Trout, especially, I like trout, freshwater trout, um, just with some butter. And this is where you need a few grams of residual of sugar. And that's where this sort of fine herb direction comes in very nicely indeed. Okay. Everybody doing okay? I think so. Yep. They're very have happy. Been able to sh have been, anybody, uh, did everybody have some of these wines? I know you didn't have all the wines at home, but in the store itself, everybody's had all the four wines for tasting. Yes. Everyone is enjoying very much. Good, so. good. And the cheese okay. and so we were here in Bad Kreuznach, which is nothing bad about Kreuznach. We get back in the car and it's only... Um, 30, 30 minutes drive across back to the Rhine Valley. We're going back to the Rhine-Hessen region. Here we were in Oppenheim before, and a little bit south of Oppenheim, we get to a little village called Bechtheim. And this is where we're going to the Machmer estate to see their Gewürztraminer. It's just over here, you see, on the Rhine Valley, in a little secluded valley just near the Rhine. Over here in Oppenheim, we had limestone. And down here, further south, we have more loamy soil. And this loam, thanks, is uh, due to the Ice Age. It's granite, which has been ground up by the glaciers and came down the uh, Rhine Valley, blown down the Rhine Valley to, with all the winds and the storms over the millions of years. So this is where all this loam came from. It came from the, the Alpine region uh, after the last ice age. So all these, all these different terroirs, we are thankful for millions of years ago when it was either uh, a sea or where we had an ice age where we had this loamy soil ground up granite. Mahma. Yep. This is, yeah. in fact, certified organic since the 2012 vintage. And if you're certified organic, you have to have the whole estate as one thing certified. You cannot just certify one vineyard. The whole estate has to be 100% certified and controlled. So they get controlled every second year um, to get your certification. The only problem is this is worldwide certification but it's worldwide except for the US. In the US, you have the NOP certification uh, where we have one problem with sulfides. And in the US, for those who want any specific details, an organic wine in the US, to say organic, it has to have below 100 ppm sulfides. And that is very low indeed. Most of our wines are around the 100 ppm but some are just over. So we cannot get NOP certification. I have one or two estates where we do have NOP certification. You do have them in Massachusetts as well from the Schaefer estate, where mm. we have three of his wines, which are NOP certified. But even those from oh, no. Haydn or Anheuser are as close as you can get to um, organic, but Machma is certified organic but we cannot write that on the label. What do we do? On the back label, we just write the certification number. So if you have that bottle in your hand at the moment, look on the back label, and you see on the back label, the certification number. It says OKO and a number. And that is the organic certification number, which proves, if you look on the internet, you'll see that, that proves that that wine estate is 100% organic. So this is what we do with some of our other estates as well, or other German producers do this. They write this ECO number, their organic certification number on the back label. Uh, we can do that. It doesn't, you, we just cannot write made from organic grapes, but it is organic. And here you can see the vineyards, I mean, they look organic. 
Best time, a very little small village. Uh, difficult to find unless you uh, look on your GPS. Very small village, and it's hidden away just on the edge of the Rhine Valley, narrow slopes. And it's a family again. And here we have Marcus. I started off with his dad, Georg, George. So it's G and M Machma. You'll see on the label, G and M, George and Marcus Machma. George, he was a great guy. I've known him for many years. Unfortunately, he passed away in uh, January, uh, which was fairly sad, but he'd had a good life. And Marcus had already taken over the estate, and he was so proud that his son is so engaged and his Marcus's wife as well. That's Miriam, his wife, and the two kids. So in 2017, this picture is just from 2017, where they were awarded the best organic producer of the year in Austria. It's a German estate, and in Vienna, they were rated as the best organic producer, which was quite, quite a nice thing for that estate. And they still carried on. They're still certified organic. Lovely family. And that's the nice thing about these wine estates. They're all lovely families working hard. So we've, we've had Riesling. We've had Silvana. Now we're moving on to Gewürztraminer. Gewürztraminer is a very interesting varietal, quite different to what you've seen before, Silvana or Riesling. Gewürztraminer has this lovely, very specific, I mean, just if you have the Gewürztraminer, pour it into your glass, swill it, and then stick your nose in the glass, and you get this beautiful rose petal coming out, this beautiful scent this beautiful spicy scent, the rose petal. And that's very typical for Gewürztraminer. So it's a Gewürztraminer, is so rose petal, lychee fruit. Mm. Very distinct. I mean, it's, it's so easy. This stands out very nicely, Gewürztraminer. Spätlaser, late harvest. So it's picked later, very ripe grapes. And has some residual sweetness. Loamy soil, the terroir, late harvest. So you see here, low acidity. Gewürztraminer is typical for Gewürztraminer, has a low acidity. The acidity levels before were all above seven, seven and a half, eight. The acidity on the Gewürztraminer is low, sometimes almost too low, but if it gets lower, sometimes the concentration, because it's, Spät laser, late harvest, very concentrated. This structure helps to keep it going. It's got a, lot of, a lot of extract in there, apart from acidity. But 4.9 is enough to keep it going. And only 25 grams residual sugar. But because the acidity is so low, you will get some of this perceptive sweetness in your palate. So there's a touch of sweetness there. So this is where you can also have Asian cuisine, but of course, it also goes very nicely with pâtés. Not perhaps not quite sweet enough for foie gras, but any nice rich pâté would be very nice indeed, or soft cheeses. Any soft cheeses or, or a gorgonzola or, or any blue cheese would be exceptionally nice. I mean, this is how you can have authentic wines with authentic food. All you need is good bread, some good cheese and a good bottle of wine. And that makes the evening. It's so easy. And it doesn't have to be expensive. And brie is a big cheese that we, I think everyone yeah, is hearing. Exactly. That, that's the nice thing. You don't have to spend a fortune. All you need is authentic stuff. Yes. And then you can have a great, enjoyable evening. Especially not if you're, if you're not on your own. <laughs> <laughs> and the wine can always make it a little bit better. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Especially. Yeah. Um, so organic, which makes you feel good. People are say ask me sometimes, is organic wine better? You don't taste any difference because you cannot taste fungicides. You cannot taste herbicides. You cannot taste insecticides. There's no taste to them. But uh, all these, this spraying stuff is not good for the terroir. It's not good for mother nature. And it's certainly not good for your body. Um, a lot of people now suffer from allergies. And this could be, if you suffer from allergy, it could be from some of the food you've, you've had in the past years. 
And that is why it's so important to try and eat authentic food, even if it's only simple food, real food. And that's why organic food is here coming very big in the U in Germany as well, um, or anything close to organic. Real farmers markets. I mean, there's a lot of farmers markets now in the US as well. Uh, real authentic food. So it's very important to think twice before you buy anything very cheap. Um, yeah, a touch of this residual sugar. As I said, very rich in flavor, this lychee spiciness, and not too sweet. And this 18 vintage is in fact the first vintage where we've reduced the residual sugar. We've had a lot of the past vintages in the Massachusetts market where the sweetness has been about 40 to 50. We have now reduced it to 25 because I think this is going to be nicer, more versatile with food. And especially as in the US, the taste is going towards more drier wines. But we don't want it completely dry because we want this wine to be versatile with spicy dishes, with Asian cuisine, or of course with cheese. I'm a great fan of cheese myself and have blue cheese with this and decent bread that is, that is getting close to paradise. And a rich, rich well. blue cheese with Gewürztraminer. I found in when I was working in restaurants, is you'd have some folks that, oh, blue cheese is too funky for me, and then Riesling is too sweet for me. And I'd be like, but put them together, and both of you will be happy. Yeah, yeah the it's thing is, you, you take a bite of the cheese and then swill it down with the wine, and then both of those funky and explodes in your mouth. Yep, it's amazing. That's why I say to people, don't. I mean, sometimes I see in restaurants of people who order wine with their food, they don't see how the wine and the food goes together. They might even have just drink water. They have the wine afterwards or before, but they don't see how the wine goes with the food. You have to take a bite of the food and then rinse it down with wine and see how this comes together in your mouth and this explosion of flavors. And this is where things really get exciting. I was in Chicago in September at a top restaurant. It's a steak restaurant where we have a sweeter Riesling, not too sweet, a cabinet. And they had a tuna dish, seared tuna with salad with um, soy sauce. And I tried this with this cabinet, Riesling cabinet, which had a little bit of sweetness. And I said, oh my God, this is absolutely amazing. This is perfect. The soy sauce, the sweetness with the Riesling, the acidity with the Riesling and with the seared tuna, that all seemed to come together so perfectly. A dry wine would not have, would not have matched. Mm. But this, that, that, that fine hair Riesling might have worked as well. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah. And this, this is the exciting thing to see how wines and food go together in your mouth. You have to have a bite of the food and then rinse it down with the wine. And that's what sometimes I'll be. It won't, sometimes it won't be perfect. No, but things that's aren't all, things aren't always perfect, but <laughs> but it's sometimes amazing how things do work. And we know that from a, from, you know, a booze standpoint, liquor, beer or wine, most of our favorite mistakes we now drink today, which is one of our favorites. So um, things like any bubbly or things like that. I mean, wine eventually was juice that was left over. And then somebody said, well, what's going to happen to it? So um, it ended up being quite a nice mistake with that juice, that grape juice left outside. We have a question here in the audience. I hope everybody realized when they had that commercial screen, it's quite different to the Riesling or Silvana. Yeah. The yes. difference is so spectacular. Um, quick question here in the audience. Yeah. Uh, the question here is, um, I know you touched a bit on climate change and how you're harvesting earlier. Have any of the vineyards moved um, closer to the North Sea? Yeah. Um, I mean, it started off about 2,000 years ago when the Romans, the Rome, during the Roman Empire. The Italians were very clever 2,000 years ago when they conquered the whole of Europe during the Roman Empire. And they found the best places to plant vines because the uh, Roman soldiers in those days, they couldn't drink water, you get diarrhea. So they had a bucket of wine every day. A soldier had a bucket of wine every day to keep him happy. Okay, it wouldn't have been quite the quality you've had today. <laughs> um, it would have been fairly thin, but with some alcohol, it meant you didn't get diarrhea. 
and it kept them happy while they're out slaughtering the Germanic tribes. Mm. But in those days, they, the, the Romans, they used to bring all that wine. I mean, you can reckon it, calculate yourself out. There were so many hundreds of, a hundred, more than a, about a quarter of a million Italian uh, Roman soldiers here in Europe north of the Alps. And if they all had a bucket of wine a day, that's a huge amount of wine. And all this used to be brought across the Alps down from Italy, over the Alps into Germany. And suddenly they realized that's a lot of damn hard work. So they found over the centuries, they found the best places to plant vines along the Rhine and the Mosel and the Nahr. And in fact, those vineyards are the same vineyards which we use today. It's absolutely amazing. The Romans were very clever to find the best places. In those days, um, it wasn't Riesling and it wasn't very tasting very good, but it kept the soldiers happy and they didn't get diarrhea. <laughs> but we are still using those same vineyards today. So it's, it's not a matter of planting different areas. It's a matter of just adapting the way you work the fields, your foliage management to make sure it doesn't get too hot or too dry. Uh, if you have, we use a lot of, you saw some straw being put into the vineyards. This is the top soil to keep your soil nice and loose so you don't get too much evaporation. Mm. And you plow the vineyards as well so that you don't lose moisture from deep down. And these roots are going down, as I said, 15 feet down or more, and they get moisture from deep down. So it's not a moisture problem, it's a heat problem, but with foliage management, we are managing to, to counteract these problems. And of course, we reduce the amount of leaves uh, using defoliage. So you don't have too many leaves there on the vine so that the sugar doesn't get too high because it's all the acidity, the alcohol content is not too high. If we had too many leaves, the alcohol content would go up too high. Mm. We'd have too much sugar being produced photosynthesis. We have all the sunshine, photosynthesis would produce a lot of sugar in the grapes. We don't want too much sugar, we just want ripe grapes. We don't want sweet grapes, we want ripe grapes. Uh, but okay, yes, there are vineyards being planted more to the north, even in Denmark. Um, but we, are, we have been able to adapt so far using foliage management and picking at the right time, not waiting too long or picking too late, as if this physiological ripeness, waiting till the pips are all brown and then starting to harvest. So we started this year harvesting uh, end of August. End of August. Wow. Uh, it's amazing. I mean, usually it was beginning of October. Now we're starting at the end of August. I and by, the middle, by the middle of September, the harvest was finished. I remember about five, seven, maybe 10 years ago now, um, uh, Ernest uh, Lausen was in the yeah. market and he was talking about how his mother was like screaming at him that he was pulling the grapes too early. And she's like, you're crazy. You're pulling too early. <laughs> Ernie's crazy. Ernie's crazy. It's great to have crazy people. <laughs> he said, no, you got to go out and test yeah. the, the grapes because they're ready to be pulled. And she went out there and she was like, you're right. We got to pull them. So that, you know, they were seeing, you guys were seeing stuff happen even about 10 years ago or so. Yeah. I mean, as I said, I mean, Ernie would be doing the same thing. You look at the berries and you see all those pips are brown and then you've got to get started with your you're harvesting mm -hmm. very quick. It's it. Well, you know, you know, we talk about here a lot of the time you think about your product and, and what that's like. And if it's a hefty product, like, you know, a Cabernet or a Merlot or a ribeye, you're going to want, you know, you can do a lot of stuff to that. Um, if you're using something like a filet or a tilapia, or you have a white grape that doesn't have thick skins, you're going to have to treat that in the same way. You're going to have to treat it very delicately to get its optimal flavor. No. And of course, nowadays, like we great. haven't just got Riesling and Pinot Noir here. Merlot ripens very well. Cabernet Sauvignon ripens well. Sauvignon Blanc ripens very well. So all these great varietals, which were never here in Germany, Chardonnay ripens very well. These varietals were not here in Germany when I started. Yeah, a comment from the from the, um, from the the audience here was that um, it's a testament to the winemakers to how much adaptable they are and. They do have a relationship with Mother Nature, and it is one oh, yeah. and and It is something very special. All you have to do is come into the vineyard, see, I mean, it doesn't have to be a German vineyard, you can go into any vineyard, and you'll see 
what Mother Nature is doing. Right. It's amazing. These are not factory products anymore. They, they used to be back in the 70s, they used to be factory products. These are not factory products. It's like authentic food. This is these are authentic wines, and you've got plenty on your shelves. <laughs> you. No, it's 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 exciting times. It is. And what's and, and you don't have to pay a fortune. I mean, you see the pricing you see on I saw the pricing. These are amazing. I mean, I looked at the pricing that you have. We've got it there. Yeah. I mean, from just from ten dollars, you can get a decent bottle of wine mm -hmm. for ten dollars. It's amazing. You don't have to pay a fortune. You don't have to take a, mor a mortgage out on your house to buy a bottle of wine. You definitely drink smarter, not harder around here. That's that's yeah. our motto every single day. It I think anything, you can get great bottles of wine between 12 and $20. I mean, that's a sort of bracket. That's part of our philosophy. We're not rich and we like to enjoy, we like to make wines that we can enjoy ourselves. And as we're not rich, I mean, now and again, I would like, I like an expensive wine, but our usual wine is not, is between 15 and $20. Mm. And I mean, I think all of us with food as well, we do the same thing. You know, we'll go out to a nice restaurant and buy a very nice steak or, you know, buy sushi, you know, some very nice sushi and go high end. But, you know, I don't know this, I'm speaking for myself. I do not eat that stuff every single day. Sometimes I just have, you know, maybe some, sausage in the fridge and then I do a, a sheet pan of some tomato or potatoes and asparagus throw it in the oven for 20 minutes pull it out and then you grab a nice bottle of wine and you can make that dish an amazing dish just with that whole experience this is what I said you don't need to pay to pay a fortune to have decent food or you need I mean now in the U.S. I mean in the old days you couldn't get decent bread you couldn't get decent beer you couldn't get decent coffee yeah. but nowadays you get you can I've seen this revolution happening in the U.S. where we can get decent coffee, decent beer, great beers in the U.S., fantastic beers, made really great, and good bread. All you need is good bread, some good cheese or some sausage or some pate and a good bottle of wine, and you're raring to go. It's so easy. Yeah, the foodie revolution is coming, and we like, well, it's already here, and we, we definitely like it. Yeah. Well, is there any more questions from the audience? No? All right. Well, thank you so much, Derek. This was amazing. We're all map people. We love maps. It always helps us find out where stuff is. And yeah, I that's that's the nice thing about Germany, everything's very close. As a lot of because of course the dollar is so strong, it means that a trip to Germ a trip to Europe is now a very inexpensive holiday. Yes, it's I quite different to what it used to be before pre-corona times. With the dollar one to one with the euro, that makes a trip to Europe very nice and easy. And yes. it's not expensive to go and stay at a hotel, a good hotel, or to go to a nice restaurant in Germany. And we need to support the restaurants. I mean, I go out as much as possible to restaurants with my friends because they need a lot of support. Same as with the US, so the restaurant trade uh, needs the support. Yeah. But we. But we've been talking about having food at home. It's so easy to have great food at home. Just go to Tulio's first to get a decent bottle of wine. <laughs> yes. We are big food pairings with that. And I did not pay for that advertisement. That was his own point he wanted to make. That was not paid for. <laughs> no, but I, I, know, I know so many good retailers in the U.S. who do a great job. Oh, thank you. I was living in the U.S., I know I would love to go to these retailers whether it's in Chicago at Binney's or in Massachusetts, so many great retailers in, in Massachusetts uh, have great selections of wines. And even on the East Coast, where some of these retailers also have good cheeses as well and meats. I don't know if, Julius, do you have meats and cheeses as well? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Some of our folks here are enjoying some yeah. of our cheeses. Exactly. Too. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah. And this is this is fantastic, I think. So well, revolu a revolution has taken place since I've been in the U.S. since the early 80s. So it's, it's amazing. Oh, that, makes me feel, that makes me feel good. It also makes me feel good that the fellow sommeliers in our, in our area are definitely trying to do sense of place and, and give the sense of culture that wine can do, which I think is something different from some of the other alcohol that we have, which is great. But I, I have a huge problem with my many friends in Germany that all my age or retired. They've been to the U.S. long ago. 
mm. in the old bad days when there was no decent food in the US. And they say, Derek, how the hell can you go to the US? Ah, oh, it's terrible. The food's terrible. The hotels are terrible. Everything's terrible. Terrible. You can't get a decent beer. You can't get it. I said, guys, I, you, I should take you all to the US. Things have changed so radically. I think I'm going to have to organize it for my friends to come over <laughs> to Boston. <laughs> we'll be happy. We'll be happy to host you guys. No, 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 because they just don't believe it. I said, you've got to come with me one day and see how things have so radically changed since the early 80s. It's, it's yeah. been amazing. Yes, we've definitely opened our doors to a lot more cuisine culture, which has been very nice. I must admit, it took quite some time till you had some good coffee. <laughs> Yes, we have good coffee now too. Great, great coffee now, yeah. Oh, no, I know. Wine, then the good coffee. Oh yeah. Thank you again, Derek, for doing this for us. Oh, uh, thank you. It's been I've been great fun uh, talking to you all and seeing you. I, I'm enjoying myself as well. Yeah. <laughs> thank, thank you, you Derek. Everybody online, it was great for you guys to join us, and we'll have more of these moving forward. It was great. Yeah. To with uh, and you also have whiskey tastings as well. That would be one of my big things to come and join. <laughs> yes, yes, my whiskey tastings are very, very big. So cheers, everyone, on the Zoom. Cheers, cheers everybody at home. And cheers here. Thanks, Thanks Cassandra. Cassandra. Thanks, guys. We'll see you next Bye. time. Take care. Bye. Okay. Bye. <laughs>